What's the biggest plot twists in history? Please like, subscribe and comment so I can create more videos for you. Probably the time during World War I the Germans disguised one of their ships, SMS Cap Trafalgar, as the British liner HMS Carmania, and by sheer coincidence and bad luck the first ship they came across was the real HMS Carmania, which ended up sinking them. A diplomat fucked up because he was tired and caused the massing at the Berlin Wall the night it came down. Gunter Schabowski was an East German diplomat who had just come back from Poland that night and was tired and overwhelmed. But, he had to read an announcement about travel rules changing, at a live press conference. And since he had just got back, he hadn't been fully briefed. The new rule was that Easterners could apply for a visa to go west for short trips, and wait a few days from the announcement to apply and be approved. The announcement was in clunky language and started by saying stuff like liberalization of travel rules, blah blah, can now visit the west, blah blah, Shabowski was reading this for the first time on the air, live. A journalist asked so when does this, I, start wanting to look prepared, Shabowski said, I, immediately, now, one applies at the border stations. This, of course, spread fast and caused people to mass at the wall, asking to go. There had been important protests before, but nothing in these numbers. Then, a border guard at the wall was preoccupied because he might have cancer and was waiting for his results. So, he didn't care enough about his job to stop people and opened the first gate. Crazy to think how such small coincidences cause 180 degree changes in the world. The head executioner during the French Revolution, Charles Henri Sanson, was the first executioner to use the guillotine. He was spending a lot of his own money on upkeep, etc. He was verging on bankruptcy. So he petitioned the Paris Commune which was the revolutionary government, for financial aid and reimbursement. They accepted his paperwork although they were going to pieces, all turning on one another. The leader Robespierre, who actually used to be opposed to the death penalty, wound up sending all his friends to the guillotine. This scared everyone so much, they wound up guillotining Robespierre. When poor Samson went to check on his reimbursement and financial aid, he was told, sorry, man. You really should have it, but you need an official signature. Only Robespierre could give that and you guillotined him yesterday. This was after Robespierre tried to kill himself by shooting himself in the head. He wound up just lying at his desk for hours before soldiers took him into custody. You know you're hated when people patch you up so they can be the ones to kill you. Poland utterly crushing the Soviet army at the Battle of Warsaw in the 20s. This stalled Soviet influence in Europe for another 20 years. After a grinding down of both Rome and Sassanid Persia in a titanic 30-year war, both sides depleted and exhausted, one wonders what will happen next. Will the war recommence in a few decades? Will one side collapse? Will the Christian victory cause conversion in Persia? No an army of Bedouin will sweep out of the desert backwater to the south and annihilate the armies of both nations, seize half the Roman Empire and destroy Persia, irreparably changing the cultures of both. Yeah, this is lower than it should be. This is perhaps one of the biggest plot twists in the entire history of the species. It was something nobody could have guessed even in say, 620, the Muslims basically had no territory then. Even in 632, when Muhammad died, it was still pretty damn unlikely. They were fighting against what was the largest empire in the west at that time, Rome. Even though the Roman Empire had lost a ton of territory, they were still very, very powerful and also fighting the current incarnation of the Persians who had had several empires over the past 1200 years or so. Yet in less than 30 years, they had taken over virtually the entire cradle of civilization, the oldest, wealthiest and most civilized areas in the western world. If the conquest hadn't happened, I highly doubt we'd mention 476 as the death of the Roman Empire. Definitely the miracle of the House of Brandenburg. So here was the situation were deep into the Seven Years' War. It's Great Britain and Prussia versus France, Austria, and Russia, 
plus minor allies on both sides. As you might be able to figure out, this was rather the pickle for Prussia. There was, if I recall, only one or two British armies on the entire mainland and those were more concerned with defending Hanover, a dynastic possession, than helping their allies with actual troops rather than money. So Prussia, the smallest and weakest great power at the time, had to face off against Russia and Austria all by itself. Incredibly they managed to do so for five years. But the cost had become very high. They lost, according to Wikipedia 120 generals, 1,500 officers, out of 5,500, and over 100,000 men. In short, despite Frederick the Great's generalship, they were completely exhausted. Cue the most bullshit event in history. The Russian Empress Elizabeth, a daughter of Peter the Great, died suddenly. And her heir was Peter III, her German-born nephew from her sister Anna. And this guy was Frederick the Great's biggest fanboy ever. He decides to save his hero, making peace with him, offers to become his ally, and orders Russian troops to march against the Austrians. So by pure luck Prussia goes from potentially being destroyed to being completely saved. The Republicans in power hated Theodore Roosevelt so they stuck him into the most powerless political position, Vice President. Then McKinley got himself assassinated and made Roosevelt the most powerful man in the country instantly and bringing in all kinds of reforms and change in the country domestically and internationally. Napoleon returning to France in 1815 to make a long story short, Napoleon invades Russia in 1812 and fails miserably, and the Sixth Coalition chases him all the way back to Paris, where they force him to abdicate the throne and they exile him to the island of Elba near Italy with 1,000 of his old guard, his most elite soldiers, in 1814. Napoleon is there for a few months before he escapes with all 1,000 of his old guard and returns to France in 1815. But that wasn't even the best part. The King of France sent an army to arrest Napoleon, but amazingly the army joined Napoleon and marched to Paris with it. And it didn't just happen once either, every army the King sent ended up joining Napoleon, so he was able to reclaim the throne of France without firing a shot. Killing Julius Caesar because no one wanted an emperor. Augustus, Octavius, becomes emperor a couple of years later. They wanted to save the Republic and prevent rule by a king. Technically they were successful. Octavian figured out he just can have all the power of a king without using the title. It worked so well, they used his name as a title above a king. Alexander the Great wanted to worship at a temple on the island Koti of Tyre. They wouldn't let him, as Tyre wanted to be neutral in the war against Persia. They asked him to pray at temples on the mainland. The twist? Alexander turns the fucking island into a peninsula and crucifies almost everyone in the city, selling the reach into slavery. Reason I remember this is because I read this amazing trilogy years ago about a guy and his friends joining Alexander's army. They spent every day hauling logs and stones to the ramp. How did he turn it into a peninsula? I get that historic engineers could do great things, but without modern equipment that must have taken a long time. Surely the people of Tai Wu LD have fled if they could have. Did Alexander kill everyone then turn it into a peninsula later? Battle of Trenton. Washington facing the end of enlistments for a huge portion of his army come the 1st of January decides to risk it all on a 26th of December raid on the Hessian garrison at Trenton. He needs to cross the icy Delaware River, march his army to Trenton, and attack the veteran troops there. He believes the element of surprise is crucial. Unfortunately, loyalist spies have warned the commander of the garrison of the date and time of the attack. Washington's crossing of the Delaware is complicated by terrible weather and his plan for a pre-dawn attack becomes hopelessly behind schedule. Even more disastrously, a group of 50 militiamen, not knowing of Washington's plan, attack a part of the garrison before Washington can attack. So not only will they have to attack during the day, but the element of surprise is lost because of the spies and the early attack. And X-200B, except. The Hessian garrison believes that the early, unrelated attack is the one the spies warned them about. So they are not on alert when Washington attacks. The Continental Army wins the battle, 
the prestige causes more soldiers re-enlist, and the US eventually wins the war. This was fun to read. I would watch a YouTube vlog with short stories like this. The Easter Rising of 1916 fails spectacularly, because the people of Ireland are actively hostile to the rebels and more concerned about the Great War. The British respond by executing the 16 leaders, and hand the IRA their biggest recruitment tool on a silver platter. Six years later, the War of Independence is won. That was kind of the plan of the 1916 Rising. They knew they weren't gonna win but had to make a statement. There was a quote we learned in school, I can't remember what it was but something like we're not fighting to survive, we're fighting to show we're willing to die or something to that effect. An assassin tried to kill President Andrew Jackson. Not one but both of his pistols jammed. Not being happy with his attempted murder, President Jackson commences to beating the would-be assassin with his cane. This wasn't a light beating, he nearly killed the guy. And then in comes Davy Crockett. The king of the wild frontier, who killed him a bear when he was only three, has to pull the president off the guy. You would think it was extremely good luck that saved Jackson but really it's because back then, pistols fucking sucked. The Second Punic War, like who the hell would have thought of riding elephants into battle. Britain winning World War II and losing most of its empire within 10 years. Germany losing the war and becoming an economic powerhouse and dominating European politics a few decades later. Womp womp. Germany losing the war and becoming an economic powerhouse and dominating European politics a few decades later. I'm no historian, so I would appreciate someone more knowledgeable weighing in to correct me, but wasn't this essentially an inevitable consequence of Germany serving as the dividing line between the USSR and the rest of Europe? West Germany, as the bulwark against the Soviet Union in the Cold War, would receive a hell of a lot of economic and infrastructural support, I'd think. That for decades the US financed Islamic fundamentalists in Afghanistan, YouTube web page, to fight off the Soviets who had invaded the country. Eventually, it was the US who ended up invading Afghanistan and fighting Islamic fundamentalists there. It's worth noting that the Mujahideen didn't just consist of religious fanatics, though. You also had just regular Afghan resistance people joining, including the Afghan national hero Ahmad Shah Massoud, a guy who fought the Taliban for years and was pretty progressive by Afghan standards. He was killed by Al-Qaeda the 9th of September 2001, two days before 9-11. But yeah, the US really did something fucked up there. You can't throw in weapons in an unstable country like that and then just leave if you care about peace. Early in World War II the Germans had developed a magnetic mine that was unsweepable and so powerful it could split large ships in two. The English had no idea what it was. They figured it was a magnetic mine of some kind but had no way to find them or blow them up without sinking their own mine sweepers. They were literally helpless and these mines were sinking a ton. England obviously pretty heavily relies on imported food so this is a huge deal. Then, just about a week after they went into real panic mode, a German aircraft dropped a mine on land right outside of London. No big deal, the mines were supposed to detonate if they were at all tampered with. Only problem? The aircrew that dropped the mine had forgotten to arm it before dropping it. So a German aircrew literally dropped what was possibly the Germans' best chance to force England to negotiate on their enemy's doorstep. The English figured out how to set the mines off without touching them and later how to make their ships undetected by the mines. The Roman Emperor endorsing Christianity. Never would have seen that one coming. The persecution of Christians during three centuries ended with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Theodosius I made the, the official religion. Constantine only made it no longer illegal. Theodosius came emperor 12 emperors and 30 years after. He was also the last emperor of a united Roman Empire. Pope is forced out of Rome. Pope seeks help of Robert Giscard, a Norman reed, recent Viking, who laid claim to Apulia in Italy. Giscard succeeds in capturing Rome. 
his soldiers continue to drain Roman coffers. Pope is asked to send him away. Giscard sacks the city, hard. Romans so pissed that they exile Pope and he has to flee under the protection of Robert Giscard. Nazi Germany forming a pact with USSR at the start of World War II, and a second plot twist is Nazi Germany then attacking USSR a few years later. Between Riss and the Germans not attacking Dunkirk, World War II could have been a lot longer and a lot different. Genghis Khan sends a large trading caravan to Khwarezmia, in the Middle East. The local governor decides to arrest the whole lot of them and sentence them to death. An exceptionally poor idea, Genghis was seeking a potential alliance at the time. Genghis responds by sending a few ambassadors to meet the Shah and ask for the caravan's release. The Shah beheaded one of them and sent the others back with their heads shaved, a grave insult to the Khan. Two years later, there was no Khwarezmian Empire. England and France England became France when France's rulers emigrated to England took over, and lost their holdings in France. Viking Age and William the Conqueror? Because those French weren't even really Franks, they were Normans who had previously come as Viking raiders from Scandinavia. Wild time. Probably not the biggest, but the recent one was those people raising like $400,000 for the homeless vet who gave the girl gas money, and then it turning out to be a whole scam, and the homeless guy turned on the couple. The couple turned on each other, and all of them have been arrested for fraud and whatnot. US losing in Vietnam while using their military. Eventually, US won in Vietnam while using Levy, McDonald's, and Nike. Trump winning the election after liberals considered his campaign a joke at the beginning. I'm a liberal who thought it was a joke BTW. People are so used to Trump now that we forget how insane that election night was. Both sides thought he was a joke and everything he said and did during the election came out negative. Really rattled the media establishment though. From the perspective of the Japanese. USA dropping two atomic bombs on popular cities. The amount of power these things contained were just unimaginable at the time. Maybe not a plot twist but more of an escalation to a level never thought possible. The crazy thing is the first country to get nuked was the USA. It nuked itself for a test. Courtesy of Yu Yofama Jojo. At the start of the Cold War, Henry Murray developed a personality profiling test to crack Soviet spies with psychological warfare and select which US spies are ready to be sent out into the field. As part of Project MKUltra, he began experimenting on Harvard sophomores. He set one student as the control, after he proved to be a completely predictable conformist, and named him lawful. Long story short, the latter half of the experiment involved having the student prepare an essay on his core beliefs as a person for a friendly debate. Instead, Murray had an aggressive interrogator come in and basically tear his beliefs to pieces, mocking everything he stood for, and systematically picking apart every line in the essay to see what it took to get him to react. But he didn't, it just broke him, made him into a mess of a person and left him having to pull his whole life back together again. He graduated, but then turned in his degree only a couple years later, and moved to the woods where he lived for decades. In all that time, he kept writing his essay. And slowly, he became so sure of his beliefs, so convinced that they were right, that he thought that if the nation didn't read it, we would be irreparably lost as a society. So, he set out to make sure that everyone heard what he had to say, and sure enough, Lawful's industrial society and its future has become one of the most well-known essays written in the last century. In fact, you've probably read some of it. Although, you probably know it better as the Unabomber Manifesto. Edit, holy cow, thanks for the gold stranger. The 101st Airborne Division being surrounded at Bastogne by German forces, refusing the offer of surrender and fighting their way out after General McAuliffe responded to the request for surrender with nuts. Comma nuts, comma the General's word echoes clear. Nuts, comma the Nazis shall hear. During the Korean War the Marines' morale was at an all-time high despite the freezing weather and low supplies of food. Then the unthinkable happened. 
As the U.S. was kicking ass they decided to continue advancing north on the Korean Peninsula when the Chinese surprised attacked them. The Marines easily won the battle and the general commanded the invasion to continue. It was at this time the Chinese were hiking in the mountains around the Marines, undetected, completely surrounding them. This left the Marines completely trapped with only one road back to safety. They couldn't even fight back because they were so fatigued. The Marines said all they could do was walk while being fired at and every so often you heard a scream. This was the turning point of the war. When the Allied troops discovered concentration camps. Imagine the absolute shock of realizing these places existed where humans were being treated so horribly. I think Band of Brothers did a great job showing this. JFK and Hitler's girlfriend Ingeravad might have ended up in marriage if his father approved of her. His father didn't like how she was already married and that she might be a Nazi spy. Japan committing atrocities equally as disgusting and sometimes worse than the Nazis and getting away with it scot-free. They refuse to even acknowledge several events that were well documented by various individuals of other nations in China and other Asian countries. Oh tell that to my history professor. He was always arguing that Nazi Germany was way worse than Japan, even after hearing multiple students talk about the amount of deaths and rapes in China that were in larger number than Jew deaths. I dunno, maybe he is just an old man that does not accept what really happened. Everyone thinks humans are going to destroy the earth, but they will find that the earth is much better at destroying humans. Humanity is a fart in the wind compared to earth. People don't seem to get just how powerful natural disasters are. Lyndon Johnson. He was an absolute buller a Senate majority leader, just a force of nature. He lost the Democratic presidential primary to JFK, and was eventually asked to be VP, so he could deliver the South, not because the JFK team liked him. So LBJ had to decide, should he give up his seat of power in the Senate, just to hopefully gain a foothold into the executive branch, and hopefully use his VP slot to propel him to the presidency eventually? LBJ decided power is where power goes, and wanted to be standing next to Kennedy in the Oval Office. So he took the VP job, gave up his role as Senate Majority Leader. And after he delivered the South in the general election, he was pretty much immediately cast aside by Team Kennedy. He wasn't groomed to be JFK's successor, quite the opposite, he was frozen out of all major policy initiatives. Sent him to perform small meet and greets and minor ceremonial functions, that's pretty much it. He was barely in the room for the Cuban Missile Crisis. They made no secret of laughing at him at social functions, saying he was a rube from Texas, openly calling him Uncle Cornpone. In particular, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy hated LBJ, they had one of the great blood, feuds of American political history, just a litany of petty and demeaning shit thrown at LBJ. And there wasn't a damn thing LBJ could do about it. To make matters worse, LBJ had some legal troubles. There were some investigations into his money, a few damning news articles on the verge of being published. Team Kennedy didn't think they needed LBJ to win re-election, and were on the verge of dumping him from the ticket. LBJ was on the verge, maybe days or weeks away of being completely washed out of politics and probably arrested. And then. Kennedy is assassinated. And in an instant, the power dynamic between LBJ and Team Kennedy completely and utterly flipped. LBJ had all the power in the world, and all the people who had spent years openly mocking and tormenting LBJ suddenly served at his pleasure. Not only did the head of the Kennedy dynasty die, but one of their mortal enemies immediately assumed power. Quite a fucking day for Bobby Kennedy. I can tell you the biggest plot twist that went right over my stupid fucking stoned head, at the end of Sixth Sense, I thought Haley Joel Osment was the dead one. An even bigger plot twist is that at the end of the movie you find out that the guy in the hairpiece was Bruce Willis the entire movie. Probably whatever was happening in the new world. They could have had their own Game of Thrones playing out, then suddenly disease wipes out everyone and a little while later some white people come around murdering and enslaving the survivors. It would be like if halfway into an episode of Friends, everyone but Rachel gets the measles and dies, 
and then Benicio del Toro shows up, rapes her and sells her apartment to the family from Full House. I'll go beyond what you ask, and give a Christmas themed one colon, so on the 24th of December 1776 the Continental Army, under the command of General George Washington, took stock of their resources and found that they only had about 8 musket balls for each soldier, and only enough powder for each soldier to have one, maybe two shots. Food and morale were also low, and soldiers were fighting during winter months in their summer clothes, some with nothing more than rags tied in the place of boots. Add to this that a condition of the Continental Army had been noised abroad, and the forces were rife with rumors that many men would not re-enlist, and recruiting was at an all-time low. Re-enlistment date fell on the new year, which was right around the corner. Things weren't looking too great for Continental forces. Now, it was customary during these days for armies to take a break during the winter, and fighting was done during the fair weather of spring and summer, hence terms like spring offensive. The Continental Army had already set a precedent for refusing to follow this unwritten code of military conduct, and British troops would have been on guard. Now, instead of British forces, Hessian mercenaries had been hired to control the New Jersey township of Trenton and its surrounding area, and they weren't so keen to this development, so of course they felt comfortable as they opted to celebrate their Christmas as normal, with feasting, drinking and reveling going late into the night, during which time Washington was able to move his armies across the Delaware River. A small band of American scouts prematurely attacked one small section of Trenton, but instead of tipping the Continental Army's hand, it worked to their advantage. There had been some intelligence gathered that the Continental Army may be up to trouble, and this small attack was written off as the very thing that warning had been about. This put the Hessian forces at ease. By Christmas morning of the 25th of December, 1776 the Continental Army positioned at that area was placed to move on Trenton, and relatively easily, defeat any resistance as most of the Hessian troops were still in bed. After a brief and almost unchallenged advance by the Continental forces, the British allies were defeated and captured. Now remember, it was common practice in these days in the event of inevitable defeat to destroy any available resources left in your possession in order to deny the enemy access to these, and if the Hessians had known what was coming, preparations would have been made to dump powder in the river, spike cannons, etc. The incredible fact that they were taken utterly and completely by surprise was crucial to what turned out to be the fantastic success of Washington's plan. Because of this one single move General Washington was able to secure enough powder, balls, wadding, muskets, cannons, cannonballs, food, clothing etc to continue fighting and was able to basically restock that contingent of the Continental Army, along with securing a very strategically important location in the township of Trenton. As news spread of the success here, the soldiers' morale improved, they renewed their enlistment, and recruiting improved tremendously. In 24 hours an army went from almost certain failure to being in a very likely position to win a war. Edit, added a few little details that I've recalled since first posting this. Franz Ferdinand driving by that, dang sandwich shop. Imgo web page, edit, pack it up, it's a lie. This has got to be it. And because he was such a nice guy that he insisted on visiting the hospital that held the people injured in the first assassination attempt on him that day. Fate had it out for the Archduke. Nothing never nowhere, then suddenly everything to everywhere all at once. It's been so everywhere you don't need a where. You don't need a when. That's how every it gets. I don't know about the biggest ever in history, but I can think of a good one I saw myself. My geography teacher, who was a victim of some really crazy accusations, there were some rumors about him supposedly fucking a 16 year old student. Turns out the guy was gay and had threesomes regularly with male models. Also, he was happily married with one. Apparently, the girl made the rumor up because she had a crush on him and it got out of hand. She confessed it later, but it was kinda too late, since everybody was already attacking him. Actually feel bad for him, he was a genuinely nice guy, and an excellent teacher. He didn't deserve to pass through that. And he had some epic pecs, no homo. 
Edit, words, edit, guys, thanks for the updates. The part where the mud with the amino acid soup got hit by lightning and some years later started thinking and wound up making spaceships. In 1274 and Kublai Khan has run out of China to conquer so now he's going to conquer Japan. His first attack fleet gets fended off by samurai, so they head back to China where they would regroup and plan a bigger, follow-up attack. On the way back to China the fleet gets sunk by a typhoon. It's 1281 and Kublai Khan is back. What does he want? Japan. When does he want it? 1281, I already told you that. He launches the second biggest naval invasion the world will have ever seen, as of 2018, first biggest, D-Day, and come to find out, the Japanese have blocked their beaches off with seawalls. He trolls around the coast of Japan looking for a place to land, and continues to do so right up until the day the fleet gets destroyed by a second typhoon. Those typhoons names? Kamikaze. That Irish platoon who fought off 10,000 rebels during the Congo Civil War and during the 1960s and on top of that the Irish were bombed, shot at, artillery and airstrike not a single person died they surrendered because they ran out of ammunition. Siege of Jardoville. The first crusade actually working. Why? Because when they sent out news of a crusade, a priest got a bunch of peasants riled up for the crusade, so they went on the crusade early with no food or organization. This failed so spectacularly that the Ottomans were still laughing when the real knights got together for the crusade. Oil companies did initial research suggesting climate change then deny climate change yet also engineer their offshore oil rigs to withstand the effects of climate change. Plastic. Revolutionized everything from medical procedures to art supplies. There are so many things we do every day that would not be possible without plastic. Or at least would be much more time consuming and difficult. Fast forward 50 or so years and the stuff is literally killing the planet at an alarming rate. I think Battle of Stalingrad was a huge turning point, it depleted and exhausted the Germans, Hitler lost his shit and resources, allies were able to plan invasion due to Germans not cleaning up their mess in Russian theater. If Stalingrad had fallen, Hitler would secure Caucasus region and Russian oil fields, capture ME and push allies out of Africa, without Eastern Front. The west coast of France would be fortified with sea defenses and Britain shore would collapse under constant air bombardment and rockets. When as an 8 year old I learned that the iconic little swordsman in a green tunic wasn't actually Zelda and instead was named Link. Zelda was just the princess who needs to be saved. Not just a major plot twist in history, but a top 10 anime betrayal. Hitler was a major factor to most of our technological and medical advancements. Without